Hello, I am Alex Went, and I am a walking, talking quantum wave function. And guess what? So are you. I know this might sound weird, which is okay, because quantum theory is weird, but it's about to get weirder. Before we go there, what do we know about quantum so far? We know that energy comes in discontinuous packets of waves and particles called quanta. We know that this wave-particle duality makes it impossible to measure position and momentum simultaneously without changing both, giving rise to the uncertainty principle. In the quantum world, objects cannot be said to really exist prior to observation. We know that subatomic particles can become inextricably linked and, in a sense, communicate without any apparent causal connection, exhibiting what Einstein dismissively called spooky action at a distance, or entanglement. And we know that quantum computing, which is based on the superposition of qubits rather than the on-off microcircuitry of digital bits, is about to go operational, which will be a real game changer. All of these quantum ideas began over a hundred years ago as thought experiments by the great physicists of the 20th century, like Max Planck, Albert Einstein, Niels Bohr, Werner Heisenberg, Erwin Schrödinger, Wolfgang Pauli, Paul Dirac, and others. Back then, the ideas were thought too weird to be true. However, one after the other, through mathematical models, laboratory experiments, and cosmic observations, the quantum theories, principles, and effects have proven right. I have a new proposition. What if quantum effects reach beyond the microscopic world of particles and waves and into the macroscopic world of big objects, like our bodies and brains, and in particular, into the realm of consciousness itself? What if all our desires, beliefs, and feelings, meaning consciousness and all its intentions, are actually macroscopic quantum mechanical phenomena? Human beings would be, not metaphorically or analogically, but actually be walking wave functions. Like me, like you. And since the rules, norms, and institutions that govern our lives are also rooted in our minds, this would mean that not just my intentions, but yours as well, and indeed all of our shared intentions, including those of societies, would be quantum systems too. Mind-blowing, yes? Well, many scientists, and not just classically-minded ones, might say no. They would say that whatever quantum weirdness is going on at the subatomic level quickly washes out at the macroscopic level. This is a process known as decoherence. Anything big, wet, warm, and squishy like the brain cannot, on this view, possibly have quantum properties. There's only one problem with this claim. No one really knows how the brain, let alone consciousness, really works. Dig into the science and history of the mind, and one finds layers of metaphors and technologies littering the road to progress. In the Middle Ages, the mind and body were composed of wet and dry, warm and cold humors, whose flow was controlled by sin and the stars, prayer and penance. In the Age of Reason, the body took on a Newtonian look. All levers and pulleys with a brain that ticked away like fine clockwork, except when broken. Come the telegraph and the telephone, the corporeal and the mental were all tied together like wires and plugs on an operator's switchboard. Sorry, you have reached a number that has been disconnected. With the transistor, microprocessor, and networks, the brain became a computer and the mind a protoplasmic version of the internet. However, the mind-body problem persists, and it's not likely to be solved by gods, Houston, or Google. Maybe we have been looking in the wrong place for the solution to the problem. What if consciousness is not a classical material phenomenon at all, but a quantum one? What if we take quantum consciousness theory, a controversial hypothesis that has been kicking around on the margins of physics biology, and neuroscience for the past couple of decades, 
and introduce it into an area of study that stands to benefit most from its insights, the social sciences. I know we're supposed to stay in our disciplinary silos, but let's face historical fact. Just about every significant breakthrough in a discipline has originated from outside its internal assumptions and commonsensical truths. So yes, we're traveling in a foreign country here, but let's try not to worry about the roaming fees. Let's start with the wet stuff, the brain, before we get into the more ethereal part, the mind. Quantum brain theory holds that the brain is capable of sustaining macroscopic quantum coherence. So we are not only walking wave functions, we are walking quantum computers. This by itself does not solve the mind-body problem because it doesn't tell us why those quantum computers would be conscious. But if true, it would allow us to project all the quantum weirdness going on at the subatomic level up to the whole brain. That in turn motivates the second part of the theory, panpsychism, which proposes that consciousness is not just a property of human beings or other complex forms of matter, but goes all the way down to the structure of matter itself. In short, matter at the subatomic level is intrinsically minded. Now that might sound a bit crazy, but panpsychism is a serious position among thinkers who are trying to interpret the broader implications of quantum theory. Freeman Dyson from the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, who knew Einstein and knows his way around both philosophy and physics, puts this theory pretty boldly. Quote, mind is already inherent in every electron and the processes of human consciousness differ only in degree, but not kind from the processes of choice between quantum states, which we call chance when they are made by electrons. Such an argument is possible because unlike in classical physics, where the physical is equivalent to the material, in quantum physics, all our familiar notions of materiality break down. And as such, there is room within its conception of physicality for a primitive notion of mentality. Admittedly, panpsychism is a metaphysical doctrine, but no more so than materialism, and thus impossible to prove by science alone. Both doctrines require a leap of faith. But here's the big difference. The materialists seem to have reached a dead end on the road to explaining consciousness. Or as they say in Vermont, you can't get there from here. Well, you can get there from quantum consciousness theory. Let me show you how. Much of what I'm about to tell you is conjecture, which is impossible to prove given our current knowledge of the brain. But if it's right, I believe it will have profound implications for not just the natural and social sciences, but our whole way of understanding reality. We need to start with the CCP. And no, that's not the Chinese Communist Party. The CCP is a principle known as the causal closure of physics. What the CCP says is that everything in reality, including consciousness and social life, is made up of the elementary objects described by physics. And as such, that everything is ultimately physical. Nowadays, this is part of the very definition of science, and as such is taken for granted in the physical and biological sciences. The CCP may seem more debatable in the social sciences, but there too, I think it is at least implicitly taken for granted. Most social scientists see their work as simply a branch of natural science, and so there should be no question about their acceptance. Others within the social sciences, post-positivists, post-structuralists, and other posties, might be more skeptical because they reject the kind of naturalistic social science presented by the CCP. However, I don't know anyone in the various schools and sects of the social sciences who would allow social theories to posit processes that violate the laws of physics or entities like ghosts or the devil which have no physical basis. So while it might take them a few beers to admit it, I think almost all post-positivists also accept the CCP as an ultimate constraint on their work. The burning question, however, is which CCP? 
or what kind of physicality governs social life. The older CCP of classical physics, where physical means material, in the sense of tiny little objects with no trace of mentality within them, or the newer CCP of quantum physics, where those tiny material objects dissolve into wave functions and the nature of physicality is intensely debated. In contemporary social science, the answer is clearly classical. Classical assumptions pervade our work from top to bottom. My point here is not that classical social science is wrong. I don't know if it is, but rather that it is taken completely for granted. Thus, when I first asked my methods colleagues why they are teaching their students classical rather than quantum probability theory, it's clear that the question had never occurred to them, and most had no idea what I was even talking about. In addition to the CCP, however, there is another more concrete reason to entertain my argument, which are the well-known Kahneman-Tversky results in psychology. Starting in the 1970s, psychologists have demonstrated the existence of numerous behavioral deviations from the predictions of classical decision theory or rational choice. These experimental findings, like order effects in public opinion research, preference reversals, the conjunction fallacy, and so on, basically prove that human beings do not form probabilities and preferences in the way we are supposed to if we were classically rational actors. This has generated reams of scholarship trying to explain our seemingly irrational behavior. But while there are lots of interesting suggestions out there, they are all essentially ad hoc, partial, and without a clear axiomatic basis. Enter quantum decision theory, which was developed about 10 years ago by mathematical psychologists and physicists. As its name suggests, this is a quantum version of expected utility theory, which allows decision makers to form probabilities and preferences according to the rules of quantum rather than classical logic. And here's the kicker. When you match up quantum decision theory against the Kahneman-Tversky anomalies, the theory predicts every one with a single axiomatically well-founded framework. This, in my view, is an extraordinarily powerful result. Indeed, I can't think of any new theory in social science that has explained so much with so little that had been so puzzling before. All of which raises the big question. If quantum effects are supposed to wash out above the molecular level, then why does quantum decision theory predict human behavior so much better than its classical counterpart? Quantum decision theorists themselves are agnostic. Having met some of them, I can say that they are very hard-nosed scientists, not given to theoretical, much less philosophical, speculation. But to my unwashed social scientist mind, their work bears directly on a second big anomaly for modern science, which is the mind-body problem, and specifically the so-called hard problem of consciousness. Namely, if we assume, as almost all philosophers and neuroscientists today do, that the brain is a classical material object, then why is this object conscious and thus also a subject, like you and me? Lots of answers have been proposed over the years, but none commands wide assent, even within the materialist orthodoxy. And indeed, as far as I can tell, no progress has been made on this problem whatsoever. After three centuries of hard work, this is a pretty damning indictment of materialism and suggests that perhaps something is wrong in their framing of the problem. And indeed, lately, some materialists have concluded that consciousness must be an illusion because it is not consistent with the classical CCP. Believe it if you can, but to me, throwing out consciousness in order to save materialism sounds like a degenerating research program than a way forward. Quantum decision theory puts still more pressure on the classical approach to the mind-body problem, since not only does the latter have to explain consciousness, but now also why supposedly classical people behave in quantum ways. However, quantum decision theory also opens the door to a positive argument, 
which is that perhaps consciousness is not a classical phenomenon at all, but a quantum one. Whether this theory will gain broad acceptance remains to be seen. Though with the growing recognition of materialism's failure, it is certainly getting increased attention, and in my view, to follow the dictum of many physicists, it is just too elegant not to be true. That seems reason enough to at least entertain the possibility that consciousness, and thus social life more generally, are macroscopic quantum mechanical phenomena. So am I, are we, quantum walking wave functions? <laughs>